Welcome to the Relate Church Podcast. How are we all doing? Good, good. I am really looking forward to sharing a word with you. Um, welcome, we have, we have lots of ages. Can we actually just like specifically welcome the children in the room today? It is an honor to have you guys with us. We have been studying for the last like six months, we've been walking through Jesus's most important sermon ever. You could say it like this. This is the greatest sermon from the greatest teacher of all time. These have been words of life, of hope, of challenge in the best possible way. And I believe that if we have ears to hear, God has words of life for us today. And as we were worshiping, I actually, uh, I'm going to go off script, so don't put the timer for me because I only have 15 minutes. No, I'm joking. You can keep it going. Um, I, I had this kind of thought as I was looking around the room, and there were some children playing in a circle over there, and my wife is like an extra trooper, and both of my kids simultaneously wanted my wife at the same time. So she was like worshiping like this with both her kids in the arm. You know... When this sermon was preached, Jesus preached this, preached this to a crowd on a mountainside. And, and I don't exactly know the circumstances, but I can say with some confidence that there probably wasn't children's ministry when Jesus first, first preached this sermon. Yes. I can imagine that there were probably children running around the mountainside as Jesus spoke these words. And there might be some of you here in this room, and maybe you're young and you feel like, okay, I'm in the adult service today. Let me say this to you. The same words of life that Jesus preaches to us adults are the same words of life that Jesus has for you. The one who spoke the Sermon on the Mount is also the one who says, let the little children come to me. For why? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus loves you and he has words of life for you. So let's read um, from Matthew 7 verses 7 through 11 today. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? There is so much that I could teach on from these words today, but I just want to share with you two simple thoughts. The thoughts are this. First, our posture before God, or or maybe a better way of putting it is the posture Jesus invites us to take before God, and secondly, God's posture before us. Recently, my wife, Ali, and I, we went and we celebrated our five-year anniversary, and we went to Tofino. Thank you. We made it. We did it. Uh, no, it's been an amazing five years. But we were camping in Tofino. It was my first time in Tofino. Show of hands if you've been to Tofino before. Okay. Show of hands. Keep your hands up if you loved Tofino. Okay. Everyone loves it because it's this beautiful place. And it's, it's kind of amazing because my son really let the little children come to me. He was just coming. Um, it's this amazing place because it's relatively not that far from us. I mean, it's in the same province as us. But... It's quite different than the location we live in. Like the waves, right? You know, you compare, I was just at Crescent Beach uh, two days ago, okay? Crescent Beach does not compare to Long Beach and Tofino. We, we were uh, camping and you could hear the sounds of the waves crashing as, as obviously you're looking out into the Pacific Ocean. Uh, secondly, the, uh, the, the terrain is different. When you're, when, you're walk, when you're driving down, you see the kind of jagged rocks all over the place. But one thing that I noticed was different was the kinds of signs that are located in Tofino. Like as you're driving along the main highway, there are signs all over the place with a blue wave that says tsunami evacuation route. And you're kind of reminded, like you are, if, if a tsunami's gonna come, this is like your, your first target. You know what I mean? You're the first ones to go. And these are the signs that we don't have around us. Or another one is the sign of, uh, of the waves. And it, it warns you that if you go into the water, there are rip currents. And if you get caught up in a rip current, obviously it's dangerous. Again, that's not a sign that we have a white rock. But lastly, there are signs all over the place that talk about bears. 
because this is a bear habitat, which means bears live around you. And they, they say things like, be bear aware. And then they go and they tell you what happens or what you should do if you come across a bear. As humans, we kind of have a few ten, uh, responses. I think it's fight, flight, and freeze. Is that the right vernacular? Yeah. And none of those work against a bear, because if you freeze, your dinner. Um, if you fight, I mean, I, I like to think I'm pretty strong, but I don't like my odds against a bear. Uh, so I'm not going to try that one. And if I run, bears are quite quick. Does anyone know what you're supposed to do if you come across a bear? You kind of should. I, you, you make yourself big, okay? And then you, you make, uh, if you have like some pots or something, you bang the pots. or And then you make a low, slow sound, like, no, maybe, <laughs> I would be toast. Okay, but you know what I'm saying. You get what I'm trying to get. And then you slowly back up, and every foot away from the bear is like you're, you're extra safe. And then eventually, hopefully, the bear runs away. Um, that is good advice if you come across a bear. Children, I have some wisdom for you. This is not the Bible. This is just my wisdom. If you're at school and you come across a bully, I don't care how much they try and intimidate you. Please, whatever you do, do not make yourself look big and then start going, okay? It won't work. It won't work. In fact, I can almost guarantee you will get bullied for that. So just, just avoid that. Um, of course, you approach a bear differently than you approach a human. And we, we do that because that is a, like a, a beast that's so much larger than us. But there's some truth in like how much more intimidating might it be to feel like how do we approach God? How do we come before someone that is so big, yeah. who's so full of goodness, who is the source of of life himself. How do we approach someone like that? Well, Jesus gives us wisdom in his teaching today. He says this in verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. What exactly do those words mean? Well, as teachers and, and, and um, uh, followers of Jesus have pondered these words, they have come to see how this is language that is used to describe a life of prayer. All three of these metaphors were, were commonly used metaphors for um, prayer, right? Asking God or, or seeking to go find God or even the language of knocking at the door of God. These were all languages um, of prayer. But I, I want to invite us to think about prayer, not in a small sense, but in the biggest possible sense of the word. Because when all of these th three phrases are put together, it's an image of a life of prayer. What is prayer? Prayer at the most basic level is a conversation with and an encounter with the living God. And what Jesus invites us to is not merely to a set aside time in our day, which is good. You should have times of prayer, but to a life of conversation with and encounter with the living God. You could say it like this. Jesus is inviting us to venture with, to go on an adventure with the God who created you. Wow. A couple of important points I want to point out. First, the language here used is, is in the present tense, which means that this is not a, a one-time action, but this is a continuous action. That's why some translations of the Bible translate it like this. Keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. Because this is not a one-time thing. There is a persistence in this language. But secondly, you might notice that there's kind of like a, an intensification of language. To ask is to humbly come before God with a need. To seek is to, in a sense, get up off of your chair and to look for God's way and wisdom yourself. And to knock is to keep at that seeking in the face of obstacle and in the face of discouragement. Jesus invites us into a life of adventure with God. This, this is an indication to us of what it looks like to follow him, which is to approach God as persistent trusters. The approach before God is that of a persistent truster. And Jesus gives us confidence that we ought to take this approach. In verse 8, he says this, For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. In essence, Jesus says it like this, Be confident of this, that if you seek God, 
and you humbly trust in him, you will find God. Let me say that again. If you seek God, you will find God. Be confident of that. And in finding God, you will find one of abundance. And out of that abundance, a God who is eagerly willing to be generous with that abundance. Everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks will find. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Everyone. Now, I know for some of you here in this room, you hear that language and you might have some, like, thoughts in your mind. You might be making exceptions in your brain right now. You might be thinking, well, yes, that's true, but what about in this circumstance? Maybe you have in your mind that of unanswered prayer. Or maybe you're kind of pondering, you're thinking, Jesus, did you really mean that? Like, what if I ask a, ask a prayer that kind of goes against what you really want for my life? Then are you going to answer my prayer? And all of those thoughts are real and legitimate. And that is a part of a broader conversation. And we could bring in other passages like that of James and kind of talk about what it looks like to ask God. But here's what I want to say. I don't want to, in my attempt to better understand scripture, dismiss the words of Jesus. Because these were the words that Jesus spoke to us. To the one who asks, they will receive. To the one who seeks, they will find. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. There is a simplicity in the language that Jesus offers us. And here, let me say this. When Jesus gives us simple language, it's not because he thinks we aren't smart enough to know the truth. No. There is simplicity in Jesus' language because at the base level of our relationship with God, there is a kind of simplicity, a childlikeness, if you might put it, of coming before God. We never move beyond the posture of that, of a child coming to their father with deep need. And that is what Jesus invites us to. Our posture is that of a persistent truster. And that leads me to my second point, And that's the thought of, God's posture towards us. Jesus gives us an insight in verse 9 and 10. He says, Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? And if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? Bread and fish. These were common staples in a Jewish diet. Think about that. You know that story of the miracle where Jesus fed the 5,000? What was in the boy's lunchbox? Fish and bread. So another way of phrasing this kind of, um, what Jesus is teaching us is like this. If your child came to you and they asked for something as basic as food for a lunch, which parent would open up that lunchbox and fill it with food that is inedible and even possibly dangerous? Of course, all of us think, no, we would never do that because even the most flawed parents know there's something wrong with that image. And Jesus is going to go on and he's going to give an argument and he's going to say, if you expect that kind of basic generosity from broken people like us, how much more can we expect from God? He says this in verse 11. If you then, though you are evil, now please don't, you don't need to read into that word evil in the strongest sense. Jesus is doing comparison work and he's saying it like this. In comparison to a God that is so good and so full of glory, You and I are deeply marked by our sin and brokenness. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? This is the kind of God that we approach, a God of abundant generosity. We approach a Father who loves to give good gifts to his children. Let me ask you, when you think of God, when you approach God, maybe in prayer or in your day-to-day life, who is the God that you approach? I don't, I don't mean to ask when I say that, who is the God that you think you, you, you want to approach? Or I don't even mean, what is the right answer in a Christian context? I mean, really, in like your heart of hearts, when you come before God, Who is the God that you approach? What is the expression on his face? What is his demeanor towards you? Is he distant? Is he ready to judge? Is he kind? Is he merciful? Is he full of riches? 
Is he generous? This is our Father, one who loves to give. When we come before God as humble children, he comes to us as Father. I can invite the worship team to come up. You know, I think one of the greatest revelations that we get in the Sermon on the Mount is just this. It's the idea that Jesus invites us into of how we are to think of God. You know, all throughout the Sermon on the Mount, the, the, the language used to describe God is not some distant word, but it is your Father in heaven, your heavenly Father. Father, this was Jesus' favorite word used to describe God. And Father is, is a concept used in the Old Testament to describe God, but it was not common, and it was usually used to describe, like, groups, like God was the father of a group. But here Jesus invites us into something closer. When he sees God, he sees God as dad. And at the center of this sermon, we read the words of what has come to be known as the Lord's Prayer. And what's the beginning of that prayer? Our father. Jesus invites us to perceive God in the same way that he does, that of father. So, our posture towards God is that of a persistent truster. And God's posture towards us is that of loving Father. And that's really actually all I've got today. I don't have, I don't have much more than that. There's something so simple in that. And yet I want to say this, there is something so essential. Because as we've been looking at the Sermon on the Mount, as we've been pondering the words of Jesus, let's come to understand this. If we don't grasp this dynamic, that we are God's children, not in an abstract sense, but in a very real, tangible sense, then nothing else actually makes sense. If you don't understand who God is, then really all that we've learned in these past few months just becomes another list of unattainable virtues that we cannot live up to. Because as we've learned about God's heart towards things like anger and judgment and loving our enemies, you know, th those all sound like great things. I think they resonate in our heart. But if you've tried to live those out, you realize you've come to the end of yourself. But that is the gift of these words because it is at the moment that we have come to the end of ourselves. It is when we are at the edge of our capacity that we know that we can come to our Father and we can ask, we can seek, and we can knock and we can be confident in that because Jesus says, God listens. Your heavenly Father loves to give good gifts. That we can come to our Father and in our brokenness we can pray, God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, your kingdom come, your will be done in me as it is in heaven. And we can be confident that he will meet us in that place. Thanks for listening to this week's message. If something stood out to you, if you'd like to submit a prayer request, or if you'd like to learn more about how you can get connected, email relate at relatechurch.ca. If you'd like to partner with us and our community initiatives, please visit relatechurch.ca slash give. It's been an honor to spend this time with you. Catch you next week.